Okay, folks, um, thanks for coming along tonight. We're uh, Dave Sharma, now Senator Dave Sharma, makes a welcome return to the Sydney Institute. He's been a good friend of the Institute for some years. Now, I'll introduce him briefly, not that I need to, um, but I will introduce him as talking on the topic of the Israel-Hamas conflict and Australian view. And as you know, uh, Dave Sharma was, uh, came out of DFAT, uh, Defence and, um, and Trade Department, he had put, uh, appointments in uh, Washington, D.C., Papua New Guinea, and, of course, as Australia's ambassador to Israel from 2013 to 2017. <clears throat> and then uh, the member for Wentworth for a while, and now the senator for New South Wales in recent times. I think you were sworn in last December, right? And so, uh, Senator Sharma, very welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Jared. And um, let me thank Jared and Anne and all the staff here at the Sydney Institute for your ongoing contribution to uh, a life and a debate of ideas uh, and ideology uh, and politics. I think um, our country is immeasurably enriched and our political debate is immeasurably enriched by the role you and the Institute play in helping to foster a lively and engaged civic discourse. The first time I addressed the Sydney Institute, in fact, was when I was the Australian ambassador to Israel, I think I was uh, back here on my midterm leave between uh, uh, when you come back halfway during your posting and I spoke to the Institute then in 2015. And at the time, uh, much like today, there was a lot of turmoil in the Middle East, but the focus, as if you can imagine, in 2015 was very much uh, the civil war in Syria and the emergence of Islamic State or Daesh. Now, that chapter of the Middle East history has past but the violence and the turmoil has unfortunately not and it's taken on a new manifestation and that's what I was intending to talk to you about today. Over the summer I spent some time reading uh, Henry, Henry Kissinger's first, first published work which is called A World Restored and as many of you would know Henry Kissinger died last year at the age of 100 in November and I was feeling somewhat nostalgic for his wisdom, so I grabbed his first published book. And A World Restored is predominantly about how a new order in Europe was created in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars at the Congress of Vienna and elsewhere, and the reasons that this order endured and provided Europe with a high degree of stability for basically the next 100 years until the outbreak of the First World War. But Kissinger, in writing this book, also um, has a number of observations which are as relevant today. And his main message was that peace is the byproduct of an international system that is willing to use force, if necessary, to maintain its underlying principles. And he warns as well that if peace alone is the primary objective of an international system with a desire to avoid war at all costs, then such a system quickly falls prey to the most ruthless states amongst the system. So what he writes in A World Restored is, whenever peace, conceived of as the avoidance of war, has been the primary objective of a power or a group of powers, the international system has been at the mercy of the most ruthless member of the international community. But whenever the international order has acknowledged that certain principles could not be compromised even for the sake of peace. Stability based on an equilibrium of forces was at least conceivable. Now Kissinger was a witness to and a victim of the great breakdown of peace in Europe in the interwar period, having been forced to flee Bavaria in 1938 with his family to escape Nazi persecution. And he found his way to the United States and his doctoral thesis, which forms the basis of A World Restored, was written in 1954 at Harvard. And his point, which I articulated before, was that the priority placed on avoiding conflict at all costs after the horrors of the First World War, while entirely understandable, was cynically exploited by the most ruthless states of the time, those being Italy, Japan and, of course, Nazi Germany. In that period, you would remember, uh, Germany occupied the Rhineland in violation of the Treaty of Versailles. 
Italy occupied and annexed Abyssinia, and Japan, Japan invaded the Chinese province of Manchuria, all in violation of League, Leagues of Nations rulings. But the international community at the time did not have the stomach or the appetite to enforce those principles. But the end consequence of a failure to enforce those principles built in order to safeguard peace was that the Western powers ensured that peace itself collapsed, ending with the conflagration of the Second World War. And it's my view that we are at risk of repeating a similar mistake today. In today's world, there are currently two significant conflicts underway involving major powers. Both have the potential to spill beyond their current theatres and escalate into larger conflicts with global implications for peace and security. And the implications for Australia are particularly stark because like all middle powers, Australia benefits disproportionately from an international order underpinned by just and enforceable principles. A world where might is right or the strong do what they can and the weak suffer as they must is not a favourable one for Australia. Now, turning to the first of these conflicts, the current war in the Middle East. This was initiated by Hamas, which is the terrorist group that also is the de facto authority in Gaza. And its attack of the 7th of October on Israel was one of the most deadly and brutal terrorist attacks in global history. 1,200 civilians were killed, <laughs> another 240 were kidnapped, many of whom have since died. And in terms of the loss of Israeli civilian life, it was the equivalent of 12 9-11 attacks in a single day. It's the deadliest day for Jewish people since the Holocaust. And it's important to remember and be clear that this was a terrorist attack. Civilians were the primary target of Hamas's operations. Women, children, infants, the elderly and many others were terrorised, slaughtered, murdered, decapitated, defiled and sexually assaulted in a barbaric and inhuman fashion, in a, ways, in a way redolent of the worst depravities of Islamic State. Now, this has all been well documented, most sickeningly by the Hamas terrorists themselves. Whether it was the 364 young people slaughtered at the Supernova Open Air Music Festival, or the charred bodies of victims whose hands were bound before they were burnt alive. Beyond the sheer magnitude of the loss, however, the attack has delivered a deep and profound sense of shock to Israel's security as a nation, much as the 9-11 attacks did in the United States. Now, we can all remember how the Bali terrorist bombings of 2002, which killed 88 Australians, shook our national soul. But imagine that this attack took place on Australian soil and that rather than 88 Australians, several thousand of our citizens were killed. Imagine how much more profound that shock would have been. Only if we reflect on and appreciate the deep national trauma this attack has inflicted on Israel can we begin to understand its response and its insistence that this can never be allowed to happen again. We also need to be clear that Hamas is not a national liberation movement, but an Islamist terrorist organisation. Hamas has no interest in the welfare of the Palestinian people it governs. Hamas's ideological commitment and purpose is not to secure a sovereign Palestinian state. Its ideological commitment and purpose is to destroy the state of Israel and evict the Jewish people from their current and ancestral homeland in the Middle East. Witness how Hamas has promised to repeat the 7th of October terrorist attacks again and again, not until such time as a Palestinian state is created, but until such time as Israel is eliminated. Witness how it's put its own military infrastructure under civilian facilities, whether hospitals or schools or apartment blocks, and actively puts its own civilians in harm's way. Witness how it's diverted massive amounts of international aid to build an underground tunnel and bunker network that has kept its fighters safe while its civilians have nowhere to hide. Witness how it's dug up Gaza's own plumbing and sewerage network to repurpose the piping into rockets 
and missiles. In fact, Hamas seeks to exploit and sometimes to magnify the suffering of the Gazan civilian population in order to gain international diplomatic leverage and to delegitimise Israel. Now, there is no doubt that the current war has seen a tragic loss of Palestinian civilian life in Gaza and an immense amount of suffering. But the moral responsibility for this lies not with Israel, but with Hamas. We would all like to see this war and its suffering end as quickly as possible. But how it ends is critically important to the prospects for future peace. If the war ends with Hamas in place, it would be disastrous for the region and almost certainly guarantee more bloodshed and strife in the years ahead. Hamas would re-equip and rebuild and launch further terrorist attacks and provoke further wars with Israel. Hamas has already initiated four wars with Israel since it ousted the Palestinian Authority and seized power in Gaza in 2007, each one more bloody and deadly than the last. Future conflict is almost certain. Hamas has promised as much. Now beyond this, Hamas would also frustrate any efforts to advance a two-state solution or broader movements towards regional peace. Just as it scuttled the last major Israeli-Palestinian Israeli negotiating effort in 2014 with the abduction and murder of three Israeli teenagers, and just as with the October 7th attacks, it aimed to scuttle the growing momentum towards an Israeli-Saudi normalisation agreement, which would have set the stage for a broader regional peace. And if Hamas is left in control of Gaza at the end of this war, then Hamas, in the language of the region, will be seen to have had a victory against Israel. Such a victory will marginalise marginalise moderate political actors in the region, give fuel to extremists and empower Iran and its proxies. This will not only threaten the survival of Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East, but it will destabilise the entire region, encouraging more Iranian adventurism. Now, finally, if Hamas is left in power in Gaza, the people who will suffer the most are the civilian population of Gaza. They will continue to be deprived of opportunity, held hostage to Hamas's militaristic and irredentist aims, and bear the brunt of future conflict. By contrast, if this war ends with the defeat of Hamas and its removal from power, the future of the region looks considerably brighter. The lives of those in Gaza could more closely resemble those of their West Bank Palestinian cousins who enjoy considerably, considerably greater freedom, security and prosperity. There could be a single Palestinian political entity, hopefully a reformed Palestinian authority that governs the Palestinian population, that is committed to coexistence with Israel and that can serve as a negotiating partner. This could in turn allow Israeli Saudi normalisation efforts to resume and efforts towards a broader Israeli-Arab peace to advance. What this might lead to is not just the end of this war, but the end of the entire Arab-Israeli conflict, which has now been running for some 75 years. The defeat of Hamas would also be a big setback for Iran and its proxies, discouraging their destabilising activities and strengthening moderate political forces and actors across the region. So this is why I said how this war ends is critically important to the prospects for future peace. Not all ceasefires are equal. Will a ceasefire be enduring and sustainable or will it just stoke future conflict and misery? This is the question. And the people who are calling for a ceasefire without prescribing what sort of a ceasefire it should be have lost sight of this important distinction. Many of these people seem to forget there was a ceasefire on the 6th of October. That ceasefire was broken on the 7th of October by Hamas. And few seem to acknowledge that the surest and quickest way of ending this war would be for Hamas to unconditionally release its hostages and surrender its military leadership. Now, none of this is to deny that Israel has an obligation to adhere to international humanitarian law and the laws of armed conflict that it needs to seek to minimise civilian casualties and suffering whilst pursuing its military objectives, that it needs to observe the principles of proportionality and distinction and other features of international humanitarian law. 
But I would say that Gaza is an incredibly challenging operational environment by design, by Hamas's design, and it's one that any Western military would struggle with. And the Israeli Defence Forces take their commitment to international humanitarian law seriously, not least because they realise it has strategic repercussions for their own state's legitimacy. The sad truth is that any war entails terrible suffering, even when the laws of armed conflict are being observed. And that is why Hamas is so culpable and so irresponsible for starting this war. And when we are discussing international humanitarian law, we should also recall that the intentional murder of civilians and the taking of holding and hostages, both of which Hamas has engaged in, are clear war crimes. And that there is only one party here, Hamas, which has demonstrated and stated a clear genocidal intent to wipe out another people. Now this war is already having regional implications, with Iran having activated its proxies to put pressure on Israel and Israel's supporters in the West. Hezbollah, the Iranian proxy terrorist group which controls much of Lebanon, has stepped up its attacks against northern Israel. Houthi rebels in Yemen, another group that has been armed, trained and financed by Iran, have succeeded in largely closing the Red Sea and hence the Suez Canal to commercial shipping with piracy and the use of armed drones and missiles. We've had Iranian-supported Shia militias in Iraq and Syria mounting frequent attacks against US personnel and facilities in the region, notably killing three US personnel in the northeastern corner of Jordan just a few weeks ago. Israel, the United States and others have been responding with targeted strikes on Houthi bases, on Iranian-aligned weapons, convoys and military facilities throughout the region, and on senior Hezbollah figures and commanders in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC. And this forceful and resolute response of the United States and its allies, particularly in the early days of the crisis, sending two aircraft carrier battle groups to the region and indicating its willingness to use force to keep regional actors at bay, this has largely been successful in keeping the regional dimensions of this conflict limited and keeping Iran deterred. But this is a day-to-day -day proposition and the risks of an accident or a miscalculation leading to a regional escalation remain high. Now, turning to Australia, we cannot remove ourselves from the implications and consequences of this conflict. As a trading nation that depends for our livelihood on the maintenance of the global order and a significant population with family and other ties to the region, we have a profound national interest in the resolution of this conflict and the terms on which it is resolved. But in my view, the Albanese Labor government is failing us here and on three fronts. Firstly, the government has flip-flopped when it comes to defending an important point of principle in the international system. That is the right to self-defence. The Albanese Labor government says that it supports Israel's right to self-defence and it supports Hamas's removal from power as a necessary precondition for peace. But then we vote for a UN General Assembly resolution that would leave Hamas in place and ECHO calls for an immediate ceasefire without specifying conditions that would need to be met. Penny, Lo Penny Wong was alone amongst foreign ministers in demanding restraint from Israel whilst the 7th of October Hamas terrorist attacks were still underway and with Israel seeking to rescue civilians besieged in their communities. Israel must abide by international humanitarian law, but its right to self-defence clearly includes using force to recover its hostages and to militarily defeat Hamas. And too often from this government, we hear, hear all the emphasis on the former and no emphasis on the latter. Secondly, the Albanese Labor government is failing to maintain social cohesion here in Australia. Inevitably, conflicts like that in the Middle East that arouse strong feelings can inflame local tensions. And it's the role of leaders in government to keep such tensions in check, especially in a multicultural nation such as Australia, and ensure that they are not allowed to spill over into outright animosity against fellow Australians and undermine our cohesion as a nation. But from the Prime Minister down, this government, in my opinion, has been too slow 
and too hesitant for whatever reason to condemn rising anti-Semitism in Australia with the result that it has now taken root and even become normalised. From the shameful crowds at the Opera House glorifying Hamas's terrorism a mere two days after these attacks took place, to the failure to condemn extremist sermons from Islamic preachers, to the slow and inadequate response to the doxing attack against Jewish Australians. We've also had senior Labor ministers freelancing with inflammatory language and accusations and a false conflation of a quite evident rise in anti-Semitism with the spectre of an Islamophobia that has not materialised. To be clear, Australians should be entirely free to protest against this war, to criticise Israel's policy and its government, and to lobby the Australian government towards this end, just as Australians should be entirely free to protest against Hamas, to call for the release of hostages and to express solidarity with Israel's right to defend itself. But what should not be tolerated and permitted, and what we are seeing far too frequently, is Australians harassing, vilifying, demonising and seeking to hold to account their fellow Australians for the religion they observe, the opinions they hold or the behaviour of a foreign entity. And this is only happening to one group of Australians. It's only happening to Jewish Australians. As Vic Aladef, a man who's devoted his professional adult life to building harmonious relations between different Australian communities wrote last week, the tsunami of anti-Jewish hatred sweeping our nation is the most all-pervasive and terrifying of our lives and, in fact, our country's history. That we have allowed this situation to develop by failing to check this mo movement in its infancy is a profound failing of our collective leadership. Finally, the Albanese Labor government is failing us by not making a meaningful contribution to the Maritime Task Force in the Red Sea. 20% of the world's container traffic passes through the Red Sea and avoiding the Suez Canal and the Red Sea between Europe and Asia and instead going via Africa takes twice the fuel and more days at sea. It's doubled the cost of moving a container from Rotterdam to Shanghai. Now these costs, increases in costs, are being passed on to consumers in Australia, adding to inflation and cost of living pressures. And as a trading nation that depends upon freedom of navigation and commerce on the high seas for our prosperity, and that has historically always contributed to maritime security operations in the Middle East, this should have been a no-brainer for Australia to make a modest contribution to this task force. And this is especially true given the requests came from the United States, our most important ally, and only a week after the US Congress, in an historic decision, agreed Australia could take three Virginia-class nuclear-powered submarines off US production lines. Now, I spoke earlier about how in today's world two international, important international principles are on trial. And the test we face, as Kissinger articulated it, is whether we are prepared to pay the price to uphold these principles or whether, through a lack of resolve, we will weaken the order that has underpinned peace since the end of the Second World War and in doing so, embolden reckless, act, reckless actors and risk a much greater conflagration down the road. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is testing the principle that one sovereign state cannot use force against the territorial integrity of another or acquire territory by force. And Hamas's terrorist attack of 7th of October against Israel and Israel's legitimate military response is testing the principle of the right to self-defence. Now, both wars are exacting a heavy human toll. The Russia-Ukraine war has resulted in some 200,000 deaths, whilst the death toll of the Israel-Hamas war is close to 28,000. And in both wars, there are loud voices growing louder, insisting that the costs have grown too high and demanding that a settlement should be found on any terms. Now, it can be hard to argue with the moral claims and sentiments of peace. Who is not in favour of an end to war or no more civilian deaths? But in many respects, the settlements that these proponents are arguing for will only supercharge and accelerate a greater collapse in global peace. 
As Kissinger warned, a failure to defend underlying principles only advantages the most aggressive actor and stores up greater conflict down the road. If Russia is allowed to keep its territorial gains in Ukraine and Putin's aggression is seen to pay dividends, then all of Eastern Europe and the Baltic states become vulnerable. China will be emboldened to seize Taiwan by force. North Korea will be encouraged to test South Korean resolve. And if Israel is stripped of its right to self-defence and Hamas remains in control of Gaza, then Hamas will be seen to have secured a victory against Israel. Such a victory will encourage terrorist groups throughout the region from Hezbollah in Lebanon to the Houthis in Yemen and their patron state, Iran, that terrorism provides the means to secure political objectives. Now, this will threaten not only the survival of Israel, but it will destabilise the entire Middle East and encourage more Iranian adventurism. Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, Lebanon, Egypt and Jordan will all be vulnerable. If we truly want peace, then we need to be defending the principles which underpin the order that deters aggressors. Now, the Albanese Labor government talks up its contribution to safeguarding global order. Indeed, at the Lowy address that the Prime Minister gave last December, he proclaimed Australia had a responsibility to uphold and defend the global framework. But at every test, at every juncture where the international system is being tested, this government goes to ground. Whether it's meaningful military support to Ukraine, a contribution to the Maritime, sea, Maritime Red Sea Task Force, or active diplomacy to achieve a sustainable ceasefire in the Middle East, the Albanese government is missing in action. Where events have called for decisive action and moral clarity, Labor has instead responded with superficial moralising and magical thinking. How else do you explain Labor's apparent belief that the destruction of Hamas an objective I think all reasonable observers of this conflict would agree is a legitimate war aim, war aim, can be achieved without bloodshed. Tragic though it is. How else do you explain Labor's apparent belief that the Houthis in Yemen can be deterred by a press release? There's a dangerous naivety at work here, a failure to understand that foreign policy is not transacted in isolation with decisions taken on one side of the world having little or no bearing on the other, Rather, it's a holistic undertaking, one guided by a commitment to principles and a clear sense of the national interest. A desire for peace on any terms, no matter how just the fight against an enemy may be, will be interpreted in Beijing and Moscow as weakness on the part of the West, and rightly so. That weakness will embolden autocrats in our own region, something that will bring danger closer to our own shores. If the Labor government is genuine about protecting Australian interests in a more dangerous world, rather than just sitting back and letting our fate be decided for us, then there are four relatively easy steps it could take. First, Australia should become actively involved in the diplomacy to support a ceasefire deal in the Middle East. One that is genuinely sustainable and that lays the groundwork for a more hopeful future between Israelis and Palestinians. Statements issued from Canberra are not going to do this. It takes active and ongoing engagement with the major actors in the region. Egypt, Jordan, Israel, the United States, the Palestinian Authority, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, the UK, the European Union. And if Penny Wong, who took over three months after the Hamas terrorist attacks of October 7th to make her first visit to the region, is not prepared to do this, then she should appoint a senior special envoy for the Middle East someone who carries some weight in the region and who can argue Australia's interests. Second, we should make a meaningful contribution to Operation Prosperity Guardian, the multinational maritime task force seeking to deter Houthi attacks in the Red Sea and make it safe for commercial shipping. As we heard from the Royal Australian Navy in the Senate last week, we have the capability and operational readiness to do this and to contribute to this mission. And the decision not to do so was a political one, not a capability one. Third, we should strengthen our support for Ukraine as it fends off Russian aggression. Rather than dismantle and bury our 45 Taipan, Taipan helicopters, we should send them to Ukraine, who desperately needs them, who has desperately sought them from us, 
and who will use them to protect the lives of its soldiers on the front lines. And we should reopen our embassy in Kiev as an important show of solidarity with Ukraine. Australia continues to pay rent on our diplomatic premises in Ukraine. We continue to pay the salaries of our local staff. The only thing missing from our embassy is an ambassador who remains bizarrely stationed in Poland. Now, fourthly and finally, the government needs to start taking anti-Semitism seriously and begin combating it rather than just wishing it away. Normally, the lead on this sort of issue would fall to the Immigration and Multicultural Affairs Minister. But the hapless Andrew Giles is too busy seeking to evade responsibility for the government's failure to prepare for and respond to the release of 149 criminals from immigration detention. So he either needs to step up or step down and a senior minister in the Albanese government needs to take seriously the challenge of community cohesion. To conclude, as we're always being reminded, including by this government, the world is becoming less certain and more dangerous for Australia. And that's why we cannot afford the sort of complacency we are seeing. Thank you. Many, many thanks, uh, Senator Sharma. So we come to questions and discussion, and you're right on time at 30 minutes. So we've got 30 minutes. Well done. I timed it, Jerry. <laughs> That's good. And everyone's got to keep their comments or questions short. <clears throat> so just come back up here. Um, just thanks for a great analysis of the region. Just talk us through, because as an ambassador to Israel, you would have, you either would have had diplomats who went into Ramallah or you went yourself. So what about the relationship between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, which I think the PA was driven out of Gaza in 2007. Mm -hmm. And is, is there a movement, uh, increased support for Hamas within the territories under the authority of the PA? Yeah, so look, um, one of the sort of worst kept secrets in the region is that most of the Arab world despises Hamas. Hamas is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood which Egypt sees as a threat to its own security and sovereignty. Um, it's also, with its brand of radical Islam, a threat to the, um, the royal houses in a lot of the Gulf states and Jordan. And so whilst the Arab world would never say this, they would be quite happy to see Hamas defeated. And the same goes for the Palestinian Authority or Fatah. I mean, Hamas and Fatah were basically engaged in a brief civil war in Gaza, where Hamas um, overthrew Fatah and took control of Gaza. And it, since then, they've been at loggerheads. Now, there is certainly some public support for Hamas uh, in the Palestinian territories, including in the West Bank. And Hamas does have some cells and fighters there. Um, I think I would put that largely down to a sense of hopelessness and a lack of a political horizon that the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank has been able to provide the Palestinian people. And I would hope that a revitalised Palestinian Authority, which almost certainly needs new leadership, it, it's not going to be Mahmoud Abbas, the 88-year-old, that inspires a new generation of Palestinians to believe in peace and coexistence, but a reformed Palestinian Authority that is less corrupt less autocratic and actually campaign a political horizon could remove the frustration that is pushing many Palestinians towards at least tacit support for what Hamas is doing. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave, for your presentation. Um, I'd like to pick you up on your fourth point about the local implications. One of the things that the local Jewish community is really puzzled about is the lack of any either political or police involvement in the level of incitement that has happened, where you've had imams threatening, uh, being obviously very uh, vocal in their threaten, and also some of the doxing emails that have gone out with threatening to kill children going to schools. The question I have is, is it a lack of legislation or is it a lack of uh, willingness by local 
communal authority, sorry, local authorities to actually institute um, sanctions against this behaviour? Look, it's a it's a very good question, and I think you're exactly your analysis is exactly correct in that the fact that no one has been held to account, no one has been arrested, no one has been charged. Um, police have not initiated any meaningful or substantive investigations into any number of incidents, whether it was the protests at the Opera House, uh, whether it's some of the sermons that have emerged from mosques, whether it was the doxing attack, uh, whether it's you know graffiti, vandalism, incitement online. Um, the police have been unwilling, I think, to test the provisions of the criminal law in a way that they should have. And I think that reflects political guidance. I mean, ultimately, law enforcement takes its guidance from its police minister, the justice minister. It takes the political temperature. And I think, um, look, I don't know if our laws are adequate, but the problem is they haven't even been tested. Um, and the way to test them is the police arrest people, charge them, pass the brief to the DPP and we test them um, in the court. Certainly there are provisions on our uh, statute books under both state and federal law that would seemingly cover... Um, some of the action. I mean, I wrote to Mark Dreyfus the week before last about this doxing attack citing a provision of the criminal code, basically using a carriage service to menace, harass or cause offence, well-known provision of the criminal code, and suggesting or urging him to ask the AFP to investigate on that basis. Um, that hasn't happened. I mean, they have announced potential changes to the Privacy Act. But in New South Wales, I mean, there's a sections of the crime code here which I would think prima facie uh, have been caught by this. Um, but we haven't seen this tested in court. So, you know, the government has been saying, and there's mentions that, well, perhaps the criminal code doesn't cover this. The, the mere fact of an arrest alone would send an important signal to the community that um, people are at risk uh, if they engage in this sort of conduct. And that's the sort of signal that has been missing, that we take these things seriously. And the sort of signal we've been sending, I think, is one of... Um, license or permission uh, that um, w the police aren't going to get involved. They're concerned to make sure that the protesters are safe, but not that they're not uh, making other members of the community feel unsafe. Um, I mean, we've had a huge amount of law enforcement resources devoted to these weekly protests that are happening here in Sydney. Um, so I think it's a real failure, and I, I think it, I think it's political leadership. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that if the Justice and Police Minister in New South Wales told the New South Wales Police, you've got to come down harder on this, that they would begin to compile briefs of evidence and investigate things. Uh, and likewise, the AFP, if they had proper direction from the Attorney General or the Justice Minister. And then we could see, are our laws sufficient? And then we could... I think there's a political will in par Parliament, certainly, to um, in both state and federal, to tighten them if need be. But the point is that, the, you know... We haven't reached that point because we haven't even tested what we've got on the statute books. Senator, um, the complexion of the uh, or makeup of the present Israeli government has sort of been commented upon in terms of the ultra right wing parties that support Benjamin and Netanyahu. What uh, impact do you think that has on the prosecution of the war? Would it be different if the coalition were made up differently? And what is the future of Benjamin Netanyahu? after the war has uh, ended? Look, I'm on the record here, so I'll just I'll be a little measured in what I say. But look, f firstly, um, Benjamin Netanyahu is not popular in Israel. He wasn't popular prior to this war because of a number of domestic changes he was making which effectively weakened the judiciary and strengthened the executive arm of government. Um, and he's certainly less popular after this war because he's largely seen, having been in power for most of the last 14 years, responsible for the security failings which were clear and manifest, um, uh, manifestly exploited by Hamas. Um, my view would be that we can only... Israel sh should and needs to go to elections soon because we need a government there that has a renewed mandate to um, firstly to continue if need be to fight this war but secondly to engage properly on what the post-conflict scenario looks like um, and Netanyahu doesn't have an interest in doing so and certainly his coalition partners um, have no interest in doing so 
Um, and I'd say the, the other concern I have about Israel's government is that um, you have a situation now potentially where the, the Prime Minister or the leader has political interests which dictate that certain decisions be made um, to guarantee political survival, including the prolongation of the war, because uh, it's almost certain that no one will seek to pass a motion and no confidence in Netanyahu will dissolve the government whilst the war is ongoing, which may diverge from the interests of the state. And I think that is a, a problem as well. So um, I saw there are protests in uh, Israel just over the weekend uh, urging that fresh elections be called. And I suspect that the coalition partners, partners that Netanyahu has brought into the war cabinet, um, Benny Gantz and Gaddy Eisenkot, um, will quite soon say we're leaving the war cabinet. Um, we need to go to fresh elections. And I think that that will be important, just as some sort of political change in the Palestinian Authority, I think, is necessary to allow the groundwork for peace. I think we need a change in political dispensation in Israel. That said, I'm not a voter there. The people are, and it will be up to them to make up their minds. Oh, Senator, I'd uh, like to talk about human rights uh, commissions. Uh, we all know what happened to Bill Leake and Andrew Bolt, who were persecuted for spurious reasons. How come the human rights commissions or alleged human rights commissions aren't taking a more active part or under, under a, um, a Rip Van Winkle 20-year deep cycle sleep? Look, I think it's, it's, it's uh, perplexing or strange that the sorts of um, organisations you would normally expect in parts of civil society to, you know, um, firstly, if nothing else, object to the... Um, the rape and sexual assault of women on such a large scale by Hamas has been largely silent. Organisations like UN Women, but also, um, you know, parts of the Me Too movement globally, but also, um, you know, human rights and civil society organisations more broadly have largely um, either refused to comment or not been drawn into commenting on what was clear clearly Hamas atrocities of October the 7th. I mean, they could be free to comment on Israel's conduct of the war, but they've chosen not to comment on that. Um, and uh, look, I think you've seen a, a sort of, it's, it's the infection of identity politics into our discourse where uh, a lot of civil society has said that this party is oppressed and this party is the oppressor and, and the oppressed can do no wrong and the oppressor can do no right. And so it doesn't matter what is committed in the name of that, uh, anything goes. And I think that's what we've seen. This is what this is the pathway that leads to sort of moral equivalence when you start to back aside rather than stand up for principles which should ensure that we're all treated equally and under the rule of law. Uh, after the 2022 20, election, you spoke here and you analysed uh, electoral mathematics and said there was no real pathway for the coalition back to government unless they regained some or all of the so-called teal seats. Does your entry to the Senate uh, indicate that uh, you've abandoned uh, that prospect? <laughs> um, <laughs> look, I, I think it's my view. Look, so firstly, honestly, I don't, I don't think... Um, uh, it will be difficult to win back Wentworth. I'm not sure I'm the right person to do it. Uh, I think there'd probably be better candidates for a better place to do it. So, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, and I think in, I can best support our efforts by helping, in my view, reposition our political brand and appeal and policy offering at a broader level rather than an electoral level to help us win back government. I do still think we. Um, Without winning back some of the teal seats, it's very hard to find, a, I think, a pathway back to majority government for us. There's certainly a pathway for Labor into minority government, and I certainly see a scenario where we can um, pick up significant seats at the next election, but I think to win the next election, we will need to at least chip into some of those teal seats. And I think we can, uh, absolutely, but I think um, we need to have a message that obviously appeals in those electorates, but also as it should, has a broad national appeal. And I think, um, you know, to me that's focusing on what Liberal governments have always focused on and have always done well, which is uh, look after the economy and manage national security um, and otherwise allow people freedom to make their own 
life choices and make their own decisions about how they want to live their lives. No more questions. Broadly on the topic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Um, make one uh, comment. You, you started with a quote. Uh, you started with a quote from uh, from uh, Kissinger. Um, we'll just note that the phrase "peace through war" was actually the personal motto of Oliver Cromwell. Um, <laughs> but what I wanted to ask you was. Uh, Two things. Do you think that uh, freeing and supporting Barghouti might in fact constitute a, a way of uniting Palestinians and moving yeah. forward? And secondly, what would it take for the Liberal Party or for the coalition to be prepared to recognise an independent state of Palestine? Uh, so look, the, the first question, um, and for those who don't know, there's a... a quite a charismatic, well-regarded Palestinian political leader um, named Mustafa Barghouti, who's been held in an Israeli jail for about 21 years now for, um, for a range of crimes. But he's one of the few figures that most people, including in Israel, and uh, would believe could unite uh, the Palestinian public that has sufficient credibility with the Palestinian street not to be seen as someone who is imposed upon them or a kind of a patsy for the... Uh, the other side, um, but who is sufficiently pragmatic that he would be prepared to negotiate. Um, the two figures people tend to mention are Mustafa Barghouti and um, Mahmoud Dalan, who who used to run the PA security forces in Gaza. Um, they're both um, people with enough credibility and enough youth to kind of re-energise the Palestinian political movement and be a counterpart. So I would think, yes, a future pathway to reforming the PA and getting a credible uh, negotiating partner would be um, his release. Uh, in terms of Australia's policy, look, I don't see us or the Liberal National Party um, unilaterally recognising a Palestinian state unless and until such time uh, Israel and the Palestinians have ne themselves negotiated the, f um, the final parameters, if you like, and solved all the issues in a two-state solution. That might change if um, a lot of our partners are doing it, our like-minded partners, but I find it hard to see a situation where in the face of, in the absence of a peace process, in the absence of any negotiations, and in the face of objections from Israel that we would seek to unilaterally do that. Thank you. I was wondering about your, your views on um, the likelihood of the US being pressured into minimising or reducing their funding and their weaponry to Israel. And uh, if that were to occur, what you thought might uh, result from that, from Israel's perspective? Yeah, um, look, so I'd, I'd say two things, or three things really. Firstly, I think, um, and people in Israel would recognise this, I think Joe Biden has to date, done a very good job in supporting Israel. You know, he was first US president to visit Israel at a time of conflict, sending two aircraft carrier battle groups to the region, helped keep other actors out and from exploiting it. Um, so I think up until now, he's done a good job. Um, second thing I say is he's under domestic political pressure for his support of Israel. That's no secret. I mean, he's worried about uh, young voters, African-Americans, uh, and even Arab American voters in key swing states like Michigan, which could, you know, make enough of a difference to help him either win or lose that state. So, um, particularly, you know, as the presidential election approaches, it's in you know uh, ten months now, or nine months really. Um, he's going to have to be more mindful of that. W what I would see shifting, though, is I think military support and arming Israel would be the last thing to move and probably not be touched. I think what you would see is. The rhetoric changing, and we've seen that from Biden himself and the White House in recent weeks. Um, possibly diplomatic support, so in the UN Security Council and others. Um, but I don't think they would... Um, look, there would be... You know, it's one of the few areas where Republicans and a large chunk of Democrats will agree as support to Israel. I mean, this is why, at the moment, this military assistance bill to Ukraine has been packaged with assistance to Israel, because the idea is that 
Republicans will support this because they want to support Israel, even if they don't want to support Ukraine in the House. So I think that is, um, I think that ongoing support is assured. But what you might see is more daylight between the public positions of the two leaders, and I think that's already starting to emerge. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Thank hello. You. Hi, David. It's Hi, David. Dennis. Nice, Blue, to, nice to see you, Dennis. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning Henry Kiesinger. I should just mention that the late Henry Kiesinger and myself share mutual cousins <laughs> on different sides of the family <laughs> okay, tree. Okay, we uh, sort and of the move next on, question, yeah. The question is about DFAT. Can I ask you about DFAT? Because I think that's a problem. Where does DFAT really sit on this Israel-Hamas conflict? Well, look, I mean, properly, look, DFAT should just reflect the views of the Minister of the Day. Um, you know, that's certainly how I always saw my role as, as when I was an ambassador. I mean, I was appointed, incidentally, by a Labor government as ambassador to Israel. I was appointed by um, when Bob Carr was the foreign minister and when Julie Gillard was the prime minister. And for the time I was there and they were in government, I faithfully articulated and prosecuted their agenda. And then when the government changed, I changed. So I think DFAT reflects the, um, the position of the government of the day. Um, you know, do they have their own private views on this or institutional views? Look, probably, but not in a way that would um, could override a sort of a minister's own personal imprimatur. I mean, I worked for Alexander Downer for, for two years in the Howard government, uh, and Downer and Howard, as you would know, were both very supportive of Israel, often against the advice or wishes of their bureaucrat and their departments, but ultimately it was advice but they took the decision and they're the political decision makers. So, um, you know, I think, that, I think the point of accountability here, and if we have criticism to direct, it should be directed at the foreign minister, the prime minister and the National Security Committee of Cabinet. Reflecting on your time as ambassador in, in Israel, um, with the ongoing colonisation of the West Bank and military support for the settlers there, what real hope is there for the Palestinians in this whole debate? In that sense? So, you know, yeah. Where can it end? Look, I think um, the settlements, if, if, if you support a two-state solution, and look, I, I, I do just as a matter of mathematics, you've got, you know, 16 million people living west of the Jordan River, Eight million roughly are Jewish, eight million roughly are Arab or Palestinian. They both have equally legitimate and historical claims to the same piece of land. How are you going to solve that? They can't exist within one state. That would almost certainly be a civil war, so you need to have two states for two peoples. And um, overwhelmingly, look, the, the West Bank is, um, is populated by Palestinians and, and the coastal plains are populated by Jews. So um, the settlements, yes, they're problematic. Um, you know, there'd be about, outside the main settlement blocks, there's probably about 100,000 Israelis living in parts of the West Bank. So this is outside the parts that are adjacent to the so-called Green Lines and that, would, and that most people envisage would be part of a sort of territory swap where parts of pre-67 Israel would be ceded to a Palestinian state in return for keeping those. So they're problematic, but I would say that... Um, Israel has shown historically it's prepared to pay to buy peace with territory. So, you know, after the Yom Kippur War, Israel was in control of the Sinai Peninsula up to the Suez Canal. But in return for peace with Egypt, they ceded all of that territory, which is much larger than the land of Israel itself, and gave them immense, you know, strategic depth and early warning and everything else. Um, they ceded all that and uprooted their communities and settlers and brought them back into Israel because um, peace with Egypt was a valuable asset that was worth having. Um, you know, there were serious negotiations with Syria under the um, before the Syrian civil war broke out, initially with Assad's father and then um, with Bashar al-Assad himself, where Ehud Olmert was looking at, you know, evacuating the Golan Heights or giving back the Golan Heights in return for a peace treaty with, um, with Syria. Even in Gaza, I mean, in 2005, Ariel Sharon, there are about 5,000 um, Israeli settlers in Gaza and greenhouses and business enterprises. Ariel Sharon, you know, forcibly uprooted those people and brought them back and said, Gaza's yours now, that's yours to manage. We don't, um, 
you know, with, with a view to thinking that this would form the nucleus of a viable Palestinian state. Hamas ruined that. So I think, um, you know, is it a challenge? Yeah, is it a, is it a problem? Um, yes, but overwhelmingly the, you know, the settler movement in Israel reflects a strand of political opinion, but um, majority opinion in Israel, if you were told you're going to get peace with the Saudi Arabians, you're going to get peace with Lebanon and Syria, um, you're going to get peace with the Gulf states and trading relationships, but you've got to create a viable Palestinian state and evacuate the settlers. I think um, that could or would happen. And what, I mean, what Netanyahu has said, at least privately, when I've been in meetings with him, um, is that it might be that you just say, you know, like at, at the stroke of midnight, um, you know, this territory will become part of an independent Palestinian state. You're free to stay there. We've got guarantees that you'll, you know, your rights will be protected. You can keep your passports and you'll be subjects of this new state or you're free to leave and you don't then have to forcibly uproot these people. So I think the settlements are a problem, but I don't think they're a first order issue here. I think they're a sort of second or third or order issue to resolving this, is, resolving this conflict. We've got time for two quick questions and responses. So there's one down the back and one up the front here somewhere or not. Um, no, no, we're down the back first. Yeah. Hi, my question's two sides of the same coin. Do you really think there's any Palestinian leaders who accept a two-state solution being one that involves Israel because they all chant from the river to the sea? And do you really think that anyone in Israel after October 7th is willing to have the West Bank be relinquished and then turn into another Gaza taken over by Islamists within a couple of years the way Gaza was and have them there? as a threat? Is, I mean, is it really a two-state solution really a realistic proposition at this point? Yeah, look, that's a very good question. And um, the sort of two, the enthusiasm or support for a two-state solution in Israel has been, you know, dwindling over the last 30 years and public support for it has been dwindling. Um, so I guess I would say, look, firstly, no, no, no person in Israel would support an independent Palestinian state on their borders that could threaten them without assurances. And that's, I think, the important caveat because the prize here for Israel is not an independent Palestinian state. It's relations with the Arab world and normalisation with the Arab world. And they know that that will effectively, they would, the Arab world, you know, the Saudis, the Qataris, the Egyptians, the Jordanians would have to effectively act as guarantors of behaviour for this independent Palestinian state. So I think, you know, the only way an independent Palestinian state emerges is one that's probably demilitarised, you know, has a police force but does not have, you know, a, a, a military and where it's sort of military type roles or functions are performed by uh, the Jordanians, the Egyptian armed forces, the Saudis, something like that. Now that's a... Now, this is this is what the US is trying to help achieve now. That's a very difficult situation. But I can see a situation where if Israel got the valuable prize of normalisation with the Arab world, plus the sort of guarantees that provides for the nature of a Palestinian political entity, then there might be sufficient trust to allow that to happen. But it's, it's still a tall, tall ask, you're quite right. Final question, it's got to be Uh, Senator, um, thank you very much for your presentation. It's been fabulous tonight. Thank you. Um, get, returning to the question of um, local political situation, you mentioned the ambiguity of the um, Albanese government over the Gazan issue. Um, is there not also a seems to be a reticence on the part of the Conservatives in Australia to really back Israel in this issue? Look, I... I don't know if I've seen that. I mean, I think certainly... Um, no, I, I, don't, I don't know if I share that view. Um, I, I think... I'd say two things, though. Um, look, firstly, I think to the extent that, you know, w w people are standing up for Israel's right to defend itself, um, you see it more on the conservative side than the other side of politics. But I would say, I, I think, two things. Look, firstly... People who don't know a lot about this conflict and its history are often intimidated against speaking out because it is complicated and people have strong feelings. Um, and when ordinary as Australians or, or even, you know, a whole lot of politicians who don't know much about these issues encounter these strong feelings and very firmly held views, they often think, well, you know, that maybe there's something I don't know. So I think surely... 
Hamas are the bad guys here. They started this. Israel has a right to defend itself, but maybe there's something I'm missing. So I think you find a lot of people I've noticed are quite intimidating at speaking out. And I, you know, I spend a lot of a lot of my colleagues get in touch with me just to ask for kind of Israel Palestine 101. You know, <laughs> what happened? When did it start? What books should I read? Can you show me the map? You know, um, can you just reassure me that that I'm on message? So I think there's there's that. And then I think. Um, I don't think this has been a feature on the conservative side, but I think on the Labor side, I think this is wrong, but I think part of their rationale has been if we speak out, we're just going to inflame community sentiment more. Now, I think that's... I look, I think bluntly they've been quiet for political reasons, concentrated political reasons involving, you know, electorates in Western Sydney and elsewhere. They haven't wanted to irritate that part of their membership base, but I think more charitably, uh, I would say that they've thought that if we speak out, all we're going to do is inflame local opinion. But I think by failing to speak out strongly, they've allowed opinion to run unchecked and a whole lot of, you know, norms to be broken and boundaries to be traversed in a way that's going to be very hard, I think, to, to repair.